I like to say that I'm 28% Buddhist. What I mean by that is that Buddhism has shaped my spiritual perspectives and that Buddhism, I think, makes me a better Christian. But I get some odd reactions when I say that I'm 28% Buddhist. And I kind of like odd reactions. It creates the opportunity for impromptu philosophical discussions, and I love that. So sometimes when I say I'm 28% Buddhist, someone says, how did you determine that it's exactly 28%? And I tell them that I'm kind of joking, of course. I just mean I love Buddhism. And that human consciousness, of course, is an infinity. Remember that Jesus said the Father and he are one and that we are all one. We are all connected to an infinite consciousness, God. And you can't have 28% of an infinity. By this point, they're sorry they asked me anything. But I love to say I'm 28% Buddhist to just discombobulate our categories a little bit. So for example, a person, a consciousness, that infinity is bigger than a religion. We tend to think of the category person and religion and religion being the big category that people are in. It's the exact opposite. A person is an infinity. Religion is in them. A person is the major category in reality, not institutional religions. I love these sort of conversations. Sometimes when I say I'm 28% Buddhist, someone will react to me and say, does that mean you're only 72% Christian? And I say, well, 72%, that's about a C minus. I suppose I am a C minus Christian. I think anyone that would say they're an A plus Christian, that seems worrisome to me. I always imagine I'm striving to be a better Christian. C minus, that's probably about right. I am now in a sermon series called Encounter being Christian in a multi-faith world. And I'm trying to revel in the existence of other religions. Variety is the spice of life. Why do we turn the existence of other religions into a problem? We should celebrate that there are so many different perspectives. God's world is so beautifully variegated. But we turn pluralism into a problem. I would like to say, though, there's a problem before that problem. Now follow me. We say the existence of other religions, if you believe Christ is the only way, is a problem. But there's a problem before that problem. Christians don't accept other Christians of different types. You know that, right? There are many Christians that will say to another type of Christian, you're not a real Christian. Christians can't even accept other types of Christians. So first we have to probably overcome that problem. Why are we so hard on each other? Why are we so righteous thinking our form of Christianity is the one true Christianity? You know that's the way it is. Many of the most righteous Christians that say that their version is the only true one, well, another version says to them, take the Roman Catholic Church. I love the Roman Catholic Church. Half my family's Roman Catholic. I studied with the Jesuits and Dominicans and Franciscans. I, I did much of my work at Boston College. I, I love the Roman Catholic Church, but technically speaking, it considers itself the one and only true church, even though it has an ecumenical spirit now post-Vatican II, and I love that impulse. It's still the case that it's doctrine that all other forms of Christian communions are deficient, except for the one true Roman Catholic Church. And so any other Protestant Christian being righteous about their position, then the Roman Catholic Church says, no, we're the right ones, and it all becomes unhelpful. We need to open our hearts. You know, anytime I'm talking about pluralism or when I talk about loving other religions, someone will always bring up 
John chapter 14 to me. And they've been doing that these past two weeks because there is a line in John 14 that is so resonant in the Christian imagination. People think of it right away. You know the line where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And they think that that sounds like Jesus is saying Christianity is the only true religion. But I don't think Jesus is talking about religion in that passage at all. First, remember what a loving moment it is. His disciple Thomas is confused. I mean, Thomas is virtually falling apart and he says in such a plaintive, pleading way, how can I know the truth? How can I know the way? He's falling apart. And then Jesus, in this wonderful act of caretaking, says, you know, give me your eyes. I am the way. Just follow me. Just come alongside me. I'll guide you. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's taking care of someone. He's not talking about what is the true religion. If you thought he was talking about religion, we know Jesus was Jewish, right? So he'd be talking about Judaism. But he's not talking about institutional religion. And this line in John 14 is deeply important to me because I think it's about love. You see, remember with me, the gospel tells us that God is love. First John chapter four, God is love. Then Jesus in the Christian heart, Jesus represents that fullest manifestation of love. Jesus is love incarnate. If Jesus is God incarnate, God is love, Jesus is love manifested. And he's saying there is no way to God except through love. He's love. No one comes to the Father but through me. You can't get to the Father but through hate or greed or fear. It's only love guides you towards God. And so I've been looking for the love you can see in other religions. Oh, you can see plenty of love. And in Buddhism, today I'm on Buddhism. And remember, I'm not trying to give you an introduction to Buddhism, sort of a Wikipedia version. I'm looking for where is the love and just taking one element and reveling in it. Buddhism is so essentially about compassion. It's inspirational. In Buddhism, they're seeking to reduce the suffering of others. They have a vivid sense of how much suffering there is in the world. But they want to help people see a way out. They believe that one of the basic causes of our suffering is the way that human beings will cling and grasp upon things. The, the Buddhists believe that life is transient, life is ever-changing, but human beings will try to grab hold of it and, and, and cling to it, and it just creates endless suffering. And so the Buddhists are trying to offer people a way out of suffering to help us learn to let go. They'll talk about attachment, that if you could free yourself of attachment, if you could achieve non-attachment, oh, you would find your joy. The Buddhists will talk about four major types of attachment. Let me walk through this because I know in some way you are clinging, we all do trying to hold on to something that is transient and will move on. Let me talk about these attachments. First, Buddhists speak of being attached to the sensual realm. They don't mean sex primarily. They mean the, the sense realm, uh, sense objects, possessions, things, experiences, bright and shiny things you can taste or touch or see. In the Western world, we call this materialism. When you become so attached to possessions that you can become so clinging of possessions, you become possessed by your possessions. You know that. I had a sweater in college. <laughs> I had this sweater that I thought was the perfect sweater. 
I, I didn't have any money to afford expensive clothes, but this was the one really expensive, beautiful sweater, and I thought, I thought it really made me look great, and I loved this sweater so much that I was afraid to wear it. I, I didn't want to wear it out. I wanted to take care of it. After about a year, the moths got to it. I only got to wear it a handful of times. We can cling on to our possessions and not learn how to enjoy them. If you can be non-attached with your possessions, you would enjoy them so much more. For the Buddhists, you could live in a palace, and if you're unattached, you could really enjoy that palace. But you could live in a palace, and if you're attached to it, there'll be no joy. The same with a shack. If you could live in a shack but not be attached to it, you could find enjoyment. It, the attachment to the sensual realm, the way we cling and hold on to things. And then they'll talk about attachment in terms of opinion, your perspective on the world. You see, your whole life has trained you to see the world in a certain way, and you overtrust the way you see the world. You hold on to it. I know I do. But the Buddhists help us remember that there is about a zero chance that you have a full grasp of reality. A zero chance. And that you need to be unattached to your versions of reality to be open. <laughs> there was this old time senator, mid 20th century, I can't remember his name. And when he was giving political speeches, he'd give a big stem winder. And then at the end, he would always say this, I love this. He would say, them's my views, and if you don't like them, I'll change them. Well, he was joking about how politicians will change their opinions. But we should have something of a similar perspective. Them's my views, but if I find out some new information, I might change them. You see, your version of the world, it's like a map, and you're living by that map but it's not the actual world. Would you rather experience a map of Yosemite or walk through Yosemite itself? Don't be too attached to your maps, your opinions. And then the Buddhists talk about attachment to rites and rituals. They mean primarily that religious and spiritual folks will become attached to the outward forms of their religion. That there is an inward essence but that will cling to the outward forms. I know as Christians, we do that a lot to our theology, our rituals, our understandings. There's an inner essence, there's a love, but we cling to the outward forms. And then lastly, the Buddhists talk about attachment to self that your ego, your ego is your self-definition and everything in your life has gone into defining who you think you are, but then you begin to cling on to that and you try to protect it. You'll move into endless cycles of self-defense to maintain your ego or promote your ego in the world. And so the Buddhists try to help us let go of ego. It's hard in our culture. We're taught to promote ourselves. We're ego-driven in a Western culture, but the Buddhists remind us that we'll create so much suffering. If you can let go of self, you will find your joy. Have you ever seen those images of a laughing Buddha? The Buddha sense that if you can just let go of clinging, there'll be a, just a natural joy so let me end with a couple Buddhist jokes. <laughs> this is one of my favorite. I think a lot of people don't like this joke so much. I love it. So a Buddhist walks up to a hot dog stand and says, make me one with everything. I love that because of that sense of, of Buddhist non-duality. They're seeking to understand that reality isn't so much subject-object, but that, that we're united with all things. That would get you beyond all attachments. If you could perceive the non-dual aspect of reality, there'd be nothing to attach to. All is one. 
the vendor hands him the hot dog, and then the Buddhist says, where's my change? He'd given him a 20. And the vendor says, oh, change comes from within. <laughs> you see, the Buddhists believe that you are not your thoughts and that you can learn through meditation. The practice of meditation is what allows one to become unattached. You can stop that clinging, that grasping. A Zen monk in the monastery went to the master and he said, are we allowed to use email here in the monastery? And the master said, well, sure, but with no attachments. No attachments. And then lastly, just to remember the laughing Buddha, why was the Buddhist fired as a coroner? Why was the Buddhist coroner fired? because he kept putting the cause of death as birth. Oh, the Buddhists have a sense that we're part of a greater eternity. So I'm 28% Buddhist. But now you hear what I mean. I just revel in the love that Buddhism is trying to bring into the world. And I know you have been made to bring more love into the world. May it be so. Amen.